Below 60 degrees south, there is a place so hostile to man, so different from our everyday experience, that it has existed in our imagination as a living fable, a place remote of endless snow and ice. This continent, Antarctica, is the size of India and China together. It is the highest, the windiest, and the coldest place on Earth. If its great ice cap were ever to melt, the major cities of the world would be drowned. The cap covers mountains twice the height of the Alps, with snow and ice 300,000 years old. In the dead heart of Antarctica, nothing can live. But at the surprisingly rich ocean margins of this, our greatest desert, there are creatures in abundance. 30 million seals. A hundred million penguins. Seabirds uncountable. And an ocean so rich in life as to be the most productive on Earth. Home of the greatest living creature, the blue whale. But this abundance is based on an ecology so fragile that if one link of the food chain were destroyed, the result could be disaster. The continent size alone is daunting to human activity. When placed over the map of Europe, the Antarctic dwarfs the familiar outlines of the countries. It would stretch from Oslo to the Sahara, from Barcelona to the Black Sea. The Antarctic controls the world's weather patterns. The vast fields of ice affect the climate of every other continent. A few hundred scientists a year peck at the edges of our Antarctic knowledge, sometimes in conditions hauntingly similar to those of the heroic age of Antarctic exploration, which has given us some of our most potent symbols of courage. After a century of effort, we still know almost as little about Antarctica as we do the dark side of the moon. The continent was once a world apart, and the men who traveled there developed their own technology of dog and sledge and muscle to deal with its landscape. But that age has ended. The few dogs left are for the recreation of scientists and support staff. In the closing years of this century, the forces which have changed so much of the rest of the planet are poised to penetrate man's last earthly frontier. In the past decade, we have become aware of the fragility of our world. Industrial pollution has caused the clouds of acid rain which have blackened and destroyed forests across Europe and Scandinavia as surely as any fire.
This same rain has ended all life in countless lakes and streams. In the forests of the Amazon, a different, now familiar destruction. Areas the size of some of the countries of Western Europe fall into the tractor and the saw. Destruction on a scale to interfere with the delicate balance of the world's climate patterns. So far, the Antarctic has remained outside the human scramble for resources. Relatively untouched, a continent to voyage to in the imagination but everything is as nature intended. At a time when man's capacity to pillage the earth seems limitless, the Antarctic stands on the threshold of a new age. Should the international treaty system, which has protected the continent for 30 years, now allow the possibility of oil and mineral exploitation? Or should Antarctica be declared a world park, for all time the last great untouched wilderness? These decisions are being made when few non-specialists have had the opportunity to voyage to Antarctica. Through ignorance, our emotions have not been engaged. We simply don't know what's at stake, what we could lose forever. To get to Antarctica means travelling to the other end of the world, through the roughest seas on Earth. To find that rare wonder, a natural system which thrives beyond the touch of man. The research ship, John Biscoe, arrives at one of the British Antarctic Survey's five permanent bases on the continent. She sailed through scenes of timeless beauty, unchanged since the first navigators came this way in the late 18th century. This is Signy Island, west of the Antarctic Peninsula. The Bisco is here to lift off the summer staff and leave behind a small wintering party for seven months of isolation. Once, overwintering in the Antarctic was a matter of desperate heroism and harsh privation. Now it happens every year, and the men who stay behind are privileged to witness one of the most awe-inspiring events on Earth, the onset of the Antarctic polar winter. In an isolation so complete as to be unimaginable to the rest of the world, the winter staff carry out their essential research into biology and meteorology. But part of their work takes them into a world of purest magic, under the ice of the frozen sea.
Life under the ice of the Antarctic Ocean in winter is one of the best kept secrets of the continent. These divers are setting out for a visit not to a sterile place of frigid rock and lifeless water, but to a scene in unbelievable contrast to the stark world above. Water temperatures under the winter ice are just below freezing, much the same as those in summer. The real difference is that winter is the time of abundance and the water takes on a transparent clarity. For the divers, it's hazardous work. They're constantly aware of the limitations of operating in these temperatures, and they often carry with them a lifeline to the world above the ice. Many of the plants and animals of the Antarctic seabed have never been studied in any detail. The divers collect samples to take back to the laboratories at Sydney Base. The divers move within a scene of life and colour that would not be out of place on a tropical coral reef. Anemones flourish, and they and other creatures of this unknown and unspoilt world are the true native fauna of the Antarctic. There is little sense of movement in the clear water. All is quiet and still. The ice above stops the restless surge and flow of warmer seas. This undersea environment is harsh and extreme, but life is thriving here, not simply hanging on at the edges of what is tolerable. The cold makes for slow growth and an extended lifespan. Sponges may live for several centuries. An undersea icicle melts. A sheltered rock face 10 meters down off Sydney Island. It is completely covered by encrusting anemones and sponges. Many of the species here have no common name and have never been seen in their natural surroundings by more than a handful of people in winter. The life cycle of these creatures is finely tuned to the short season when it is possible to feed and to grow. These remarkable colonies of creatures thrive in these conditions because the water is so cold. The low temperature means their metabolism is slower than similar animals in more temperate and open water. Therefore, their requirement for food is reduced. For them, the cold is an ally. This limpet making its laborious way is a striking example of how the creatures below the ice exist in a world created by the cold. It is possible that this little creature has been moving across these rocks since before Amundsen and Scott reached the pole. And sometimes, under the ice, the feeling of being on another planet is overwhelming. Looming through the crystal water, flashing with the colours of the rainbow, these are Antarctic stenophores, travelling by the rippling of the cilia at their edges. Little disturbs this tranquil world, but down here the coming of spring can be heralded by the savage grinding of a grounded berg, often destroying communities which have been hundreds of years in creation.
Long before there is any sign of spring on Sydney Island, the Weddell seals return to breed. About 500 of them come to Sydney each year. In September, at the end of the Antarctic winter, they heave themselves out of the water to give birth. They are the earliest of the Antarctic mammals to do so. That they can is another example of the specialist nature of the creatures of the far south. They succeed because they can keep their breathing holes open during the freezing weather of September and October by continually sawing at the edges with specially adapted teeth. Before any other Antarctic bird or mammal has returned to begin their own breeding season, the Weddell seal pups are already learning to swim and to catch fish. The parallel world of the seabed continues its own development towards spring. Small crustaceans known as amphipods browse upside down. They are feeding on diatoms, which are growing on and within the ice itself. As isopods go, this one is a giant, inhabiting the area where ice scrapes the bottom. A giant that is, by the normal standards, outside the special conditions of the Antarctic. Here, things grow slower, but bigger. But it is the fish which are the real wonder of the world below the ice. Some of them appear ghostly and transparent because their blood is white. It lacks the hemoglobin of creatures from warmer lands and waters. The blood of ordinary fish is similar to our blood and freezes at about minus a half a degree centigrade. This water gets colder than that. Many species which spend all their time in the coldest Antarctic waters have developed an antifreeze called glycoprotein in their blood. They do not freeze when cooled down to minus two degrees centigrade, or even when they come into direct contact with ice. Above the ice, the Weddells and their pups wait out the last squalls of the dying winter. On Sydney, British scientists have been studying Weddells for 20 years or more. They found that they can give birth every year until they're at least 24 years old, starting as early as two years old. They tend to come back to the same place to have their pup. Females die when their teeth finally wear out from gnawing the ice. As winter eases into spring, the pups disperse, already fully able to swim and catch fish. When the Weddell pups have gone, the changing light, the slow thaw, and once again the sound of running water are the signs that spring has arrived. The graceful snow petrels are the first birds to come back. They often have to dig out their nesting places after late snow flurries. As the ice melts, the birds bathe in the newly released fresh water. They are followed by pintado petrels. And as September gives way to October, the giant petrels come back to take up their traditional nesting sites beside the shore. And finally, across the ice, flocks of penguins arrive. 
a dailies and gentoos to continue the cycle of countless years, hardly touched by the influence of man. Away from the relative comforts of the permanent Antarctic bases, it is still possible to find men living and working in a way hauntingly similar to the early days of exploration and discovery. This is the empty vastness of Alexander Island, at the base of the Antarctic Peninsula. Two Britons and two Bulgarians are making temporary camp midway through a summer field season. An example of the international cooperation common among Antarctic scientists. In all of time, no more than three people have been here before. When the British Antarctic Survey aircraft leaves the party on the Nichols snowfield, they face their own company, working and travelling for three months. From the doorway of a tent, a view of a range of mountains that has no name, no record of anyone setting foot there. For the geologists, a chance to do new work. At best, these rocks have been glanced at before. This is a typical old curve. You may go. Yeah, not, not bad. It's not sad, it's not. This is science for science's sake. A building up of a picture of how the Antarctic continent was created and what geological forces are at work here. You see, this is like a shell. Yeah, right. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I think it's not it shell. Is. But now, when results like these are published, it won't just be scientists who look at them, but economic geologists and mining engineers. When bad weather makes work or travel to a new location impossible, time to learn a strange language and be utterly apart from the normal processes of the civilized world. So like we have uh, garlic and peas. Oh. Is it tasty? Doreshto. <laughs> Very hot. <laughs> what is potato? Bulgarian? Kartofi. Kartofi. Yeah. So we use kartofi to thicken the stew. Nice stew. No go it's very hot. Some quite nice sedimentary structures, some good folds and, and thrusts and things. So uh, I think uh, a good day's uh, work and that wraps it up here. And uh, hopefully if the weather's good tomorrow, we'll be moving on to the Durantius Glacier. Over. An improvement in the weather can mean a two-hour scramble to break camp and cross the 40 miles to the next destination. Phil, yeah. you're better not to go in the end, yeah? I think so. Yeah, it's just closing up again. I think so. It's just closing up. But just as quickly, the Antarctic closes in again. To move in these conditions when the snow is blowing or contrast is gone could literally mean disappearance from the face of the earth. From this morning onwards, the weather was clearing, especially in the direction we were going, over Tufts Pass, uh, which goes up to about 4,000 feet, so we need uh, five hours of clear weather, really. And then since deciding to go, and two hours getting ready to go, it is in fact closed up again. So, uh, overall, it's best not to go, just in case. So we'll now put the tent back up and have a cup of tea and wait till tomorrow. Even in the Antarctic, the wind stops eventually. Camp is broken, and the nickel snowfield is left to itself. It will be many years before anyone passes this way again. This is perhaps the purest impact of man on the Antarctic environment. 
a hushed progress by a small party of professionals through the vastness, leaving the least of traces behind. The Antarctic has always been protected by the natural defenses of an extreme climate and great remoteness, and the continent has also been shielded from too much human interference by a strong man-made barrier, the Antarctic Treaty. The representatives of 39 nations meet regularly to decide the future of a continent with no native population, the size of which dwarfs their own countries. Since 1960, this system has preserved the peace between nations in an area of the world which before then was being dragged steadily into conflict. And well before Glasnost brought a thought to East-West relations, the two superpowers, America and Russia, were working together in the Antarctic. Under the treaty, all armed military activity is outlawed on the continent. There can be no nuclear installations, fishing is controlled, and the main purpose of human activity is the pursuit of science. The potential fuse of Antarctic discord has always been territorial sovereignty, and the territory is historically claimed by seven countries, with the largest areas going to Australia, Norway, and New Zealand. France has a small claim, but the potential source of greatest conflict has always been in the Antarctic Peninsula. Territory here is claimed by Britain, her recent enemy Argentina, and Chile. These claims overlap, and it is the great beauty of the treaty system that since 1960, all claims have been effectively frozen, not recognized, but not denied. The countries who claim Antarctic territory take differing but very real measures to keep their position alive. In the disputed area of the peninsula, for example, the British Antarctic Survey has a high profile. Funded by the British government at 15 million pounds a year, BAS relies on a reputation for sound science and a flexible and efficient support of ships and aircraft to maintain an active and visible presence. The five permanent British bases are manned summer and winter and carry out a variety of internationally respected scientific programs. The large base at Rothera, near the foot of the peninsula, is used as a forward station to send field parties by air deeper into the Antarctic. The Argentinians lack much of a reputation for Antarctic sciences. They rely on a strong cultural identification with the Antarctic as no more than the logical extension of their own country. They have some bases, manned by unarmed servicemen, but there is a strong emphasis in teaching Argentinian schoolchildren that the disputed section of the Antarctic is the sole property of Argentina. Other claims are dismissed from the map and the minds of the new generation. The other claimant of the disputed territory, Chile, also has bases manned by unarmed servicemen and a policy of total identification of the area with mainland Chile. A strong buttress in the support of their claim is here, in King George Island at the very tip of the peninsula. The Chilean government organizes that families live on the base, 
Sometimes it is even arranged that children are born here. The Chileans say that they alone of the claimants have a true population, however artificially maintained in the disputed territory. The relative lack of tension between the three claimants has been one of the great triumphs of the Antarctic Treaty. But 1991 has become a significant date for the survival of this international success story. Then the treaty powers can decide to modify or even abandon a system which has ensured 30 years of peace and international scientific progress in the Antarctic. What could force the abandonment of these ideals is the signing in New Zealand last year of a minerals convention. This lays down strong environmental safeguards, but for the first time, it legitimizes the possibility of commercial exploitation in the Antarctic. The time of the scientist as king of the continent has ended. From now on, he may have to share his kingdom. For a long time, we've seen it entirely as a scientific preserve. Uh, maybe we've had as long as scientists as anybody could rightfully expect to pursue our activities unmolested, so to speak. But I think that these new influences may sharpen science. They may bring uh, new factors to play, which will provide a new spur to scientific research, because it will have to be more critically oriented. surface is dreadful. Yeah, it's pretty sugary, isn't it? Yeah. Modern geological research tends to suggest that the Antarctic should be no different from other continents, rich in oil and minerals, poised for the world hunger for resources to overcome the tremendous expense and difficulty of extracting them. Whack. Very tough, this stuff, actually. This British field party is not prospecting for exploitable minerals. They are following the entirely legitimate scientific process of cracking open the secrets of the continent. And by doing this, they also maintain the reality of the British claim over the area. But it is no accident that territorial claims in Antarctica are protected by research which increases our knowledge of the continent's resources. Today's pure science could be tomorrow's invaluable commercial data. Many of those who know and love the Antarctic, like writer and filmmaker Edwin Mickelborough, see the despoilation of the continent as almost inevitable. It is a policy of governments, and industry to look towards the Antarctic as a place of future exploitation because it's the last area of the world to be exploited and sooner or later we will run out of things elsewhere and we will exploit the Antarctic. It's a continuation of a process which has been going on for 200 years as European man has opened up the world and the Antarctic represents the last final chapter. Today, in the Antarctic, scientists still move through channels choked with shifting ice to get to their summer bases. On the surface, there is little hint of anything to justify pessimism about its future. Oceans around the continent remain the least polluted and the most productive on Earth. But it is here in these waters we can find evidence of the effect of man's early interference with the Antarctic environment. These seas provide one of the greatest natural wonders of the world, the Antarctic life cycle.
Despite the harsh environment, this ocean is the largest source of marine protein on Earth. But the food chain, the link between the most developed species and the humblest, is extremely short. And at its heart is this three-inch shrimp, the Antarctic krill. The krill exist in swarms of millions of tons, and no one yet knows their exact distribution or life pattern. But they are an important source of future protein for a hungry world. In more temperate waters, we take our food from some intermediate point in the chain. In the Antarctic, we hunted the culminating creatures, the whales and seals, which in turn had lived on the little krill. To understand the krill is to understand the nature of the Antarctic seas. The British Antarctic Survey has a long-established research program into the biology and distribution of this key species. The survey's research ship samples krill stocks over a wide area of the Antarctic Ocean. Researchers now believe this shrimp has a total volume and weight of more than the whole human race, some 650 million tons. Samples from the ship are studied at the survey's field station on South Georgia. And it is these studies which have suggested that the life system of the Antarctic seas, centered on the krill, is one of the most efficient in the animal kingdom. These studies have shown that the krill is the staple food of most Antarctic fishes, birds, seals and whales. Bird Island, just off the tip of South Georgia, is a good place to see the relationship of the krill and the birds and seals of the Antarctic shoreline. This little island, surprisingly green in the southern summer, is like South Georgia itself, outside the area covered by the Antarctic Treaty. It is British territory. But it is part of the Antarctic ecosystem. Here in summer, the continent demonstrates the enormous richness of wildlife it can achieve. albatross, the greatest of the world's seabirds, has become a symbol of Antarctic wildlife, and it nests on Bird Island. The wanderer has a wingspan of four meters and a world population of no more than 20,000 pairs. They live on squid, which in turn live on the universal provider, krill. Could you lift him up a bit more, please? That's it. On Bird Island, there has been a 22% decline in the number of wandering albatrosses since the early 1960s. And they are still declining at the rate of 1% a year. The scientists have been unable to find a reason in the breeding grounds of Bird Island why the albatross numbers are falling. It now appears that young birds are simply not coming back to breed in the numbers they once did. No one can be certain why the young birds are dying. But in recent years, there has been an increasing number of birds found with fishing gear in their beaks, particularly hooks from squid catching boats. There has been a big increase in squid fishing in the Southern Ocean. It is impossible to estimate the number of birds who have died at sea with hooks caught in their stomachs. It's a problem that can only get worse. Fleets are descending on the Southern Ocean in increasing numbers in a scramble for the last great fishing grounds. The black stains on these Japanese boats is from the ink of a million squid.
as a hungry world turns more to the seemingly inexhaustible supplies of squid and krill that the Antarctic contains, it becomes vital for us to understand any disturbances that damage its short but delicately balanced food chain. The great bird consumer of krill in the Antarctic, far greater than the albatross, is the macaroni penguin. The colony on Bird Island has about a quarter of a million macaronis. They nest on a wide, rocky slope rising out of the stormy sea. Their arrival on shore looks painful. But penguins have strengthened chests which can withstand this pounding on the rocks. Each bird and each surviving chick may eat a kilo of krill a day. This means that this colony alone consumes upwards of 350 tons of krill every day. The penguins have left their mark on Bird Island just as surely as any human colonists could have done. There is a road, thousands of years old, trodden by millions upon millions of penguins up from the seashore to the nesting places higher in the rocks. As the young penguins grow, their parents spend more and more time at sea finding the necessary krill. Evidence is accumulating to suggest that since the great whales, which consumed krill by the ton, were nearly wiped out by us, other krill feeders, such as the macaroni penguins, have experienced a population explosion. What might happen if the big whales return? The work on Bird Island is designed to monitor any changes in the penguin populations. The volume of what they need to eat to survive needs to be accurately known and their travels through the ocean need to be tracked and recorded. Even here, on the gentler fringes of the Antarctic, the summer weather can soon change for the worse. These are the other major inhabitants of this tiny section of the Antarctic perimeter, the fur seal. There are two million of them. A century ago, the fur seal was hunted almost to extinction. The last commercial catch was in South Georgia in 1907. It was imagined the fur seal was extinct and no more were seen until a dozen pups were found on Bird Island in 1930. By 1956, the colony numbered 3,500 and thereafter increased at 17% a year. And fur seal numbers may now be back to what they were before sealing began.
the breeding success of the fur seals is remarkable. When the pups are a week old, their mothers go off to sea to feed. When they return, they suckle their pups for three days. Their diet on Bird Island consists entirely of krill. There is evidently plenty available to them. The vast increase in their numbers is having an effect on Bird Island itself. As the beach becomes overcrowded, they push further up the slopes of tussock grass, wearing great sections of it away. A control area, fenced off by British scientists, shows what the island would be like if it wasn't for the growth in numbers of the seals. But what has allowed the seal population to grow is the availability of the krill uneaten by the generations of whales removed from the Antarctic scheme of things by man. The fur seals were themselves once the victims of savage hunting, which reduced them to the very edge of extinction. Abundant krill has enabled them to come back, an example of how important krill is to that system. If we tamper with it further by overfishing, the dangers are immense. On land, the advance guard of the new age on the Antarctic continent has not been the mining engineer or the oil man. It is the international tourist. For the tourists, it's the ultimate adventure. Few people have swum in the hot waters of a still active volcano on an island in the Antarctic. But they represent an acceptance that the Antarctic is there to be tamed, even played with. Um, I'm very much impressed with the wildlife here. It's absolutely magnificent. It's a pity, of course, too many people will be coming here, but, you know, just to walk around, as we just did, among half a million uh, penguins, uh, like walking in the, in the center of any large city, is a fantastic experience, which I certainly wouldn't want to miss. But I realize it's going to complicate things in the future for, for these islands. I personally think that it is most important to have some part of our polluted and overexploited planet left in its pristine condition. And I'm coming more and more to believe that Antarctica should be made into a world park within the framework of the existing Antarctic Treaty. Meanwhile, new runways are being built to service more and bigger bases. Bases whose only reason for existing is to secure a position round the negotiating table when the future of the assets of the Antarctic are decided. Everywhere, the increasing signs of man.